can there be peace in the southern Philippines? Bomb blasts kill worshippers and a Catholic cathedral after a landslide vote for wider self-rule in the mostly Muslim region. Will the attacks hinder efforts to end nearly 50 years of war with rebels? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. It was hoped half a century of conflict in the southern Philippines was coming to an end at long last. But on Sunday, two bomb blasts in the Muslim majority south were a reminder of the fragile security situation. The first explosion was during Sunday mass inside the Catholic Cathedral in Holo, the capital of Sulu province. A second blast happened as soldiers arrived at the scene. Dozens were killed and injured. The attacks followed last Monday's referendum in the region of Mindanao, which overwhelmingly voted for more self-rule in an expanded autonomous region. But Holo and Sulu province narrowly rejected the deal. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first Jamila Alandogan sets up our discussion from Manila. The first bomb exploded inside the cathedral while mass was ongoing. Then panicked uh, survivors and ch churchgoers rushed out where they were met by a group of soldiers on a truck responding to the first attack. That's when the second bomb was detonated right outside the cathedral. And according to the Philippine military, it was placed inside a container box in a motorcycle parked right outside the cathedral. While this is not the first time that attacks like this one happened in Hulu, the message is quite clear to the Philippine government and to all other groups operating in, um, in Holo that, that Holo will always remain to be a powder keg all across the Mindanao region. That despite efforts of the military basically to contain the situation, despite the entire region of, um, um, of Mindanao under martial rule and despite multi-million dollar funds that the government and civil society groups are unable to contain Holo at this point. It comes at a very difficult time that there is a referendum, that, mi uh, that the midterm, uh, midterm elections are well underway. And it's good to know that even if you look at the map of Holo, it may seem very small, but it is one of the most militarized areas in the southern Philippines. Almost all armed groups in the area operate in Holo. There's the more Islamic Liberation Front, the more National Liberation Front, and several factions of the notorious Abu Sayyaf group, not to mention private armed groups being run and operated by local political elites there at this point though it remains to be seen how this will impact or at least this attack can impact the security situation on the ground the Philippine government said it will respond strongly against perpetrators this is Jamela Lindogan for Inside Story well, as Jamela mentioned there, there was a referendum last week in the Mindanao region and nearly 3 million Filipinos took part. 85% backed an agreement to create a self-administered area called Bangsamoro. The referendum follows a peace deal signed back in 2014 between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or MILF. Rebels gave up their goal of an independent state in exchange for more autonomy. The MILF has agreed to demobilize up to 40,000 fighters and end their decades-long rebellion that has killed more than 100,000 Filipinos and displaced millions of others. So plenty to look at today and let's bring in our guests now to do so. In Manila, we have Jose Antonio Custodio, a defence and security analyst and former consultant of the National Security Council in the Philippines. In Siem Reap, Cambodia, via Skype, we have Emma Leslie, director of the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies. And also in Manila, via Skype, is Steve Rood, formerly the Philippines country representative for the Asia Foundation. A very warm welcome to all of you. Jose, let's first of all address these bombings. We've got, at the time of a recording this show, some 12 hours after the attacks, no claims of responsibility. But who are the prime suspects here? Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, it's really difficult to say who are the prime suspects, uh, who, who actually did it. But, of course, the prime suspects would either be uh, the Abu Sayyaf, you know, or 
or any of the, of the groups that actually Jamela mentioned, even private armed groups could have been behind it to sow the stabilization for whatever political agenda they have. So it's still too early to ascertain and might even be uh, done purposefully by this, whoever did that, so to sow confusion uh, as to who really is behind it so that um, it will be more difficult for the government to track who, who, who who under, uh, undertook this uh, very dreadful act of uh, bombing the cathedral. Mm. So, like I Steve, said a while ago, can, it's can we uh, link possibly this attack to last suspects. week's referendum, where, uh, of course, a huge majority voted for a new era of self-governance in this region, but notably, Hollow rejected it. Well, I think the fact that uh, Sulu rejected it and the bombing are disconnected facts. Uh, and actually, the Abu Sayyaf elements of which were mentioned by your correspondent have pledged allegiance to Islamic State. And this technique of a second bombing taking out the responders is an escalation that we haven't seen yet here in the Philippines. And it sort of bespeaks technical assistance from Islamic State to increase the impact of the kinds of attacks that Abu Sayyaf is undertaking. I mean, it really undermines, doesn't it, how difficult peace in this region is. The MILF may have come to some sort of agreement with the government, but there are many other groups, such as Abu Sayyaf, that still pose a huge threat. Yes, indeed. In fact, part of the agreement that the government reached with the MILF is a complicated series of measures on both sides that lead to the decommissioning that was mentioned of the MILF fighters. And much of that has yet to happen. So while we will see some decommissioning as a result of the plebiscite being passed, in the future there are many hurdles to be leapt over. OK. Uh, Emma, this referendum that happened last week, I mean, it came five years after the peace agreement um, between the government and the MILF. Why did it take so long? And why, indeed, as Steve mentioned, are we still in the process of decommissioning? Well, certainly because the outcome of the agreement takes time to implement, certainly because, there's a, as you can hear, a lot of stakeholders and a lot of complex politics involved. But I think that what happened in Hollow today um, highlights the need for this, this process to continue to be fast-tracked because engaging a large, moderate Muslim population and 1.5 million people came out and voted yes um, to this referendum... Um, shows the need to bring this middle population up to some level of strength, to some level of equity, some shared sense of development, but more importantly, to address a historic injustice that's been there for decades and which this population is hungry to have a chance to show how they might govern this area. Now, none of us are naive enough to think that that doesn't go without some level of ongoing challenges, some outbursts of violence, certainly how do we manage extremist groups, but empowering this population and this particular autonomy gives that a robust chance of um, some level of peace and security going forward. Mm. OK. Jose, how much autonomy will Mindanao have? Well, um, before I answer that, I'd also like to address the previous that how long did it take? Well, um, if we uh, look at it, uh, there was supposed to be already in a... Uh, uh, Congress was supposed to have work, uh, agreed on this uh, law um, during the previous administration. But just to show how fluid the situation is in Mindanao, uh, there was this uh, Mama Sapano incident wherein uh, police were killed in a uh, operation against uh, Marwan, who was a um, form, uh, foreign militant. And the, the um, botched operation um, led to a backlash against an earlier attempt to pass a Bangsamoro basic law. Mm. Now, um, uh, uh, back to your uh, question, uh, in, ma in many matters there's a level of autonomy except for defense and military matters. That remains under the national government. And that is a very tricky um, issue now because of the fact that uh, as the uh, Bangsa Moro Autonomous Region um, tries to find its way through uh, governance, um, uh, it will have to resolve uh, issues like this, wherein how will the military um, and police um, operate in, 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 in uh, their region, especially if, for example, the perpetrators of such uh, uh, incidents are 
are identified with any major uh, secessionist, secessionist mm. group. And usually that's a tricky part. That's a, that's a very uh, big problem because that's when um, uh, uh, obstacles are, are, are Well, that, that, that's erected. an interesting point and, uh, that you raise there, Jose, because of course they've got a huge possible. test facing them already now in hollow. How do they respond to this particular attack? It's going to yeah. pave the way, isn't it, for many people to look at how the military is going to respond in the future? Uh, it's, it's a test case of how, yes, of how uh, not just the military itself, but the entire uh, national security apparatus of mm. the national government will uh, handle this, like the police, the intelligence, and so on and so forth. So this, um, the government has to show not just resolve in running after them, but, um, but uh, uh, competence in doing so, in bringing, uh, uh, and bringing to justice the correct people, the, 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 the ones who really perpetrated it. If not, then this will be uh, seen as a... Um, as a weakness in the government, and you might then have uh, such operations being launched by um, groups that are against the uh, uh, the, 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 the the peace process, just to advance whatever um, extremist advocacy that they have. And um, Mindanao, from uh, is from central to 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 western uh, western Mindanao is. Uh, chock full of those types of, um, of militant, extremist, or even criminal organizations. Um, and um, many of them can operate either by themselves or under the um, uh, remote control of another uh, group. It, it's not um, impossible to imagine that even though uh, it does have the hallmarks of uh, of an ISIL, ISIS type operation mm. that given the level of lawlessness in uh, Holo, that that might have been carried out by, let's okay. say, an extremist group, but uh, with the blessings of another group. Right, right. Uh, Emma, how should the military respond, do you think, uh, in a way that will not or least likely uh, derail this process that's been so long in coming? Well, I think, I mean, one of the points coming out of that Mama Sopano example is that the partnership, the very robust partnership between government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and a number of other stakeholders and partners and mechanisms on the ground, which have been put in place over the last 20 years, was largely overlooked. And so we do see where government acts independently of other um, supportive, um, peace-loving partners on the ground like the MILF then we do see outbreaks of violence. So I think it's very, very important that the Philippine government now take seriously this vote and continue that partnership for peace because it's only when those that have some sense of stake in this territory mm. feel that they have some control over their own security will we see a change in that dynamic. So um, I think that the military, the police, the Bangsal Moro Islamic Armed Forces, but also the international monitoring teams, the decommissioning bodies, all of the international partners will need to work together. Um, and that's the only way forward. And of course, to be clear, we're talking about the Bung Samoro um, and not the entire Mindanao Island. And of course, um, that also uh, creates a challenge in terms of the other armed groups that operate on the rest of that territory. Uh, Steve, how much challenge is there on, in this area? I mean, we've got a three-year transition period now and then an election to choose an executive. For example, these MILF leaders, how challenging is it going to be for them to govern when they're used to fighting? Well, the government of the MILF some years ago realized that as they were getting closer to a solution, to an agreement, they needed to prepare for that. So there have been a number of institutions stood up over the past uh, years which involve the MILF, which involve the government, which involve the international community. So there's a development agency, there's a leadership and management institute. So they have been working towards that. At the same time, it must be said that the current leadership of the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, which is being abolished, the current leadership has been very uh, cooperative in setting things up so that there's an easier transition. So as international transitions go, this is a pretty well-prepared insurgent group to try to move into some of the governance issues. Mm. Um, 
Jose, the, the, the current government, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, but is that the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, the ARMM? Um, many have looked at that and said it, it was a failure. Do, do you agree? And what lessons could be learned from that experience? Well, um, the uh, MILF chairman himself had said that um, the biggest hurdle that, or the biggest challenge that they are facing is actually uh, the issue of corruption. And uh, many see mm. that the ARMM have failed because of uh, the um, corruption on so many levels that was seen. In fact, uh, a previous ARMM uh, governor was, is being, uh, had, had faced jail time for that. And um, uh, therefore, that is a big question. And can, the, um, can these uh, secessionists, uh, the leaders of the secessionist movement, once they move into um, a governance role, and together with other uh, leaders also, is that will they be able to break that, uh, that uh, um, affliction or that, 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 uh, that, that uh, problem of corruption, or will they be sucked up into the system also? Mm. Because it's not just um, conflict that is a problem there, but also a lot of social injustice. Um, like, uh, like, for example, Jamela had said a while ago that uh, there are the existence of private armed groups, and these are polit political figures or political clans. A, a, and uh, these political clans um, tend to disenfranchise a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Muslims. And therefore, that then makes... Um, um, uh, uh, groups such as the secessionists attractive now to um, to um, disenfranchised uh, people. Therefore, um, would the MILF be able to, um, or and their f and other leaders be able to um, be different from what happened in the ARMM leadership, or not? And that remains the biggest mm. question. And um, of course, right now. people so, are going to be uh, expecting, they've got pretty high expectations, haven't they, they? Yes. Um, Emma? They, this is a very impoverished area. People will want to see improvements to their standards of living. They want to see employment opportunities. They want to see better schools, better infrastructure. How quickly does the MILF have to implement these changes? Well, firstly, the ARMM has made a significant effort in the last couple of years to eradicate corruption. So I think that's a little bit of an old story. But also, let's not only look at it this through a security framework. I mean, part of the reason that the MNLF and the MILF take up weapons in the first place is a sense of injustice and indignity about the way that Manila has, has treated them for so long. Mm. And so it's not just schools and better economy and development that people are looking for. It's a recognition of a historic injustice. It's dignity. And I think that's why there have been so many celebrations over this past week that finally they had the possibility, the power to say what they wanted and, and to enforce the agreement and to continue on what they have been um, negotiating for for this past 20 years. People, 100,000 lives have been lost. There have been massacres all across um, this area by repeated Philippine militaries and administrations. Finally, we're setting that right. So certainly, poverty is an issue, but it's not the driving factor that started this conflict in the first place. So yes, schools will continue to function. Civil servants will continue to get paid. Um, Manila has made sure that there's a, there's a way to continue to bring 5% of the the national budget into the area. There will be money provided by the national government to make right conflict areas. Um, but this is not what the people of the Bangsamoro have been demanding, is, is a better economy. It's that they want to be recognised and they want to, the right to govern themselves. And I think that's what's significant about this past mm. week and we, what we have to hold on to. It doesn't take away the security complexity, but it does mean that we have a better chance of addressing those that we call disenfranchised because we have now enfranchised them. They now have the possibility. And Steve, how key was President Rodrigo Duterte to all of this? Because he, of course, is a, a Mindanao man himself and, and peace in the region was one of his key campaign promises. Has he managed in some way to overcome that sort of natural distrust that's built up over generations in the area? Well, in some ways he has. I mean, he has... Uh family connections to Muslims. Um, he has, as mayor of a city down in the south, Davao City, 
had to live with the insurgents and come to uh, modus vivendi with them. Uh, and in particular, though, it was his general insistence on reaching the final agreement. He wasn't very much bothered about the details. He left that others up to others, including the MILF, to craft the actual law. But he asked Congress and pressed Congress to get it done. And then he went down to Cotabato City and held a rally there. And Cotabato City is now joining the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in a way that it didn't join the previous autonomous region. So his impact has been quite significant. Uh, he uh, has thrown up, I will say, one of the hurdles that I mentioned before, because in the original agreement, there was supposed to be a branch of the Philippine National Police called the Bunksamoro Police, uh, and he has refused to countenance that from the very beginning. So the Moro Islamic Liberation Front has decided that they would take this organic law, but there needs to be new arrangements for how the decommissioning will happen mm. in the absence of this Bangsamoro police. Okay. And Jose, what other obstacles might be coming from Manila in terms of perhaps Duterte's successes or Supreme Court rulings from the authorities there at the center? Well, um, I can say there's still a uh, um, a um, case filed in the Supreme Court regarding that, and we still remain. It's, we still have to see what the Supreme Court's decision will be regarding, uh, for example, specifically Sulu's uh, Sulu Holos, uh, uh, inclusion in that uh, particular um, uh, autonomous region. Um, however, okay, coming from a security angle, um, there is a lot of um, distrust. Okay, and um, especially uh, in both sides. Okay, specifically, for example, in the case of um, the armed forces, uh, it has uh, ha it has uh, it it. Although there are public displays of uh, of um, support, okay, but in, uh, internally there are also grumblings, and that is, for example, why the um, the decision on the. Uh, uh, on this Bangsamoro police force was reconsidered because it came mainly from pressure from within the security establishment uh, regarding the um, the possibility of such a uh, of a, such a force uh, being uh, used for other purposes. Okay? Mm. So again, like I said, um, although there is no f um, real evidence on on that force becoming that, but there are suspicions and uh, mistrust or uh, distrust issues. Because, as you did say, uh, that has been like um, not just a 50-year-old war. It's been uh, ongoing uh, even in the Spanish colonial period and even the American colonial period. This is just the latest manifestation of, of it. So uh, distrust has, has, um, has um, existed okay. from generation to generation among of course, okay. uh, members of the military. Emma, just in the last minute that we have, how optimistic are you that Mindanao can continue on this path to peace? Pragmatically optimistic, knowing that there are many challenges ahead, um, that we all need to get behind them and support them, that the people have spoken. But more than that, they've shown us that what the possibility of peace talks and peace processes can do mm. Um, once an agreement is signed, we expect that peace should come, but we know that it's the implementation of that agreement. So I'm sure that in southern Thailand and Myanmar and many other places around the region, people are looking to this optimistically, but knowing the challenges ahead. OK, really interesting discussion. Thank you very much to all our guests for joining us today. Jose Antonio Custodio, Emma Leslie and Steve Rood. And thank you too very much for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.